This is Daniel Poppy, host of How to Write Good. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Hey, it's Baxter Colburn here from Public House Media. Did you know that we just added a store here at Public House Media? No, I'm not talking about a grocery store where you can go buy apples or bananas or peanut butter, which are all fantastic, especially when peanut butter's on all of those. Anyway, we've added a store here at Public House Media so you can not only come and represent your favorite podcast network, but also represent your favorite shows as well, too. Just go over to phmedia.com. And look in the top right corner where you'll see the, the button that says store. Click on that and you can search through all of our great products. Or if you go to our Facebook page, Public House Media, you can see on the left-hand side a tab that says store. All of our products are listed there as well, too. It's the new Public House Media store. You don't want to miss it. It is fantastic. Buy some of that great swag to support your favorite shows and to support Public House Media. Check it out today. Tiana Vander High here, host of the Refined Redhead podcast on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast. Once you're done with this episode, you should definitely come check out my show, the Refined Redhead podcast, where we talk to real people about relevant information in hopes of inspiring you to chase after whatever dreams you've set out to accomplish, persevering through whatever obstacles are in your way. A new show comes out bi-weekly every Tuesday. So don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of the Refined Redhead podcast. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. The latest headlines. The Houston Astros, the defending World Series champions, got better adding Garrett Cole. The insightful interviews. Rick Saratella, NFL Draft Bible. With how much emphasis is put on the position, yet how many over the last couple of years we've had questions, why do we put such an emphasis on drafting a quarterback number one overall? The bottom line is there's not enough good quarterbacks to go around. And I think with the new CBA, it's really a low-risk gamble now. If you look at the playoff teams, the common denominator, good quarterback play. The hottest takes. I think the guy to blame is the one guy who hasn't left yet. I think Russell Westbrook is one of the bigger problems in Oklahoma City. Can all be found on Press Row. Broadcasting is part of the Public House Media Network. Here's your host. It doesn't matter what your name is. Christian Heimel. All that is old is new again. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And we are now at that point where it's just like we drew it up. Rockets, Warriors, and the Cavaliers, the Celtics are going to be there. It's, oh my goodness, could, could, just, could the NBA be any more predictable in a year in which the summer became so crazy with Paul George heading to Oklahoma City and everybody thinking that the Thunder were going to have a chance at this with Kyrie Irving being traded to Boston and then Gordon Hayward going to Boston. Um, Nothing really happening with the Warriors. Uh, The one thing that we all expected is still happening. Gordon Hayward gets injured six minutes in. The Warriors are the second place team and it's a distant second place to the Houston Rockets. Uh, The Oklahoma City Thunder don't exist. The Cavaliers almost lose in the first round. LeBron James goes through multiple roster overhauls in the same season. Kyrie Irving gets injured a month before the playoffs. And yet, everything we thought would happen is going to happen again. Welcome on Press Row, everybody. Christian Heimler here with you. Uh, We're going to speak with Tom Westerholm of uh, MassLive.com, Celtics beat writer for MassLive.com. He's going to tell us what's been the biggest key to the Celtics' success so far in this postseason. Does it really matter what they're doing this year? Um, Does this team have what it takes to get past Cleveland, potentially win an NBA championship if they make it that far? We're going to get to your listener questions as well. Uh, A lot going on here in the world of sports. So much fun stuff to talk about. Uh, We'll get to all of it as well. Don't you worry about that. Game 7 coming up tonight uh, between the Predators and the the, uh, Winnipeg Jets. The right to play Vegas in the Western Conference Finals. The Eastern Conference Finals. Congrats, Caps fans. You finally made it uh, after nearly 20 years without reaching the Conference Finals. 
uh, Alexander Kuznetsov, uh, excuse me, uh, Kuznetsov getting the goal from Alex Ovechkin, and you guys advance on to face the best team in the East in Tampa Bay. Uh, that series starting up tomorrow um, on the 11th, and then of course you have uh, the NBA getting set and ready for their next uh, contest. Uh, the Western Conference Finals beginning next week, uh, as well as the Eastern Conference Finals also. So uh, we're going to talk with Tom Westerholm in just a little bit uh, about all of that, about what's going to happen here with the Celtics and all this fun stuff. And, and, you know, who's really to give credit to? Because, I mean, I know a lot of people have been excited about what Brad Stevens and are really kind of finally starting to see the genius that is Brad Stevens. But what he's been doing for years in Boston and even at Butler is somehow working in the NBA. And is it Brad Stevens or is it the players that Danny Ainge has brought him? Uh, so there's still a lot to figure out. And we'll discuss all of that in a little bit. A couple headlines here uh, for you guys. Uh, let's see. David Price for the Boston Red Sox. Carpal tunnel syndrome bullpen session coming up this weekend. Who knows if he will have that uh, if he will be able to uh, to pitch anytime soon for the Red Sox, a team that has been scuffling as of late. Meanwhile, the Yankees have been playing better than anybody else. Uh, Mark Ingram testing uh, positive here, suspended the first four games. However, his agents are saying that they're not for PEDs. It is for illegal drugs instead. Um, Johnny Manziel hospitalized after reaction to medication. Uh, our hopes uh, that he is okay and able to continue what is his potential quest back to the NFL? Uh, he's looking to do that, of course. Also in Major League Baseball, uh, you had uh, Paxton, uh, excuse me, uh, James Paxton for the Mariners throwing the uh, first no-hitter for a Canadian-born player ever, and he did it in Toronto. How about that uh, the other day, no-hitting the Blue Jays uh, and, and pitching very, very well. But I, I want to start today in baseball with, uh, and, and it's been talked about a couple of different times, but this how the mighty have fallen and, and it's so funny i love the way that sports imitates life and art imitates life because matt harvey and his career in major league baseball um has been the the classic tale of you know quick rise and even quicker sharper drop um matt harvey in his first 3 years with the Mets, his first two were nothing really exciting to talk about. When you look at Harvey's numbers uh, through his first three seasons in Major League Baseball, uh, let's see here. You look at two thousand and uh, excuse me here, two thousand and twelve. He goes three and five in ten starts with a two seventy three ERA. Okay, not bad. Uh, two thousand thirteen finishes fourth in the Cy Young Award voting. Fourth. Despite a nine and five record in twenty six starts, one complete game, a two twenty seven ERA, one hundred and ninety one strikeouts, thirty one walks. Opponents hit. Let's see. Uh, opponents hitting less than two hundred against him uh, over that time. Two thousand and fourteen, he misses because of injury. Two thousand and fifteen, he comes back, and he goes thirteen and eight. With a 271 ERA, 188 strikeouts, 37 walks, was an absolute stud, and gets the Mets within just a couple outs of the World Series. He's right there getting taken out in the World Series in Game 6 with the lead uh, after wanting to go back out there. And now listen, I, I remember when this actually happened. I had flashbacks to Grady Little leaving Pedro Martinez in, in 2003 in Game 7 of the ALCS against the Reds, uh, against the Yankees. I had flashbacks, but I also completely understand where Terry Collins was coming from. You want your hot hand there. Matt Harvey felt like he was the guy. He wanted it. John Lackey's done it multiple times. You see different pitchers uh, who are like that. Josh Beckett did it when the Marlins beat the Yankees in 03. Um, but from that moment on, Matt Harvey, there were moments, there were memes that started coming about. You pitch. Uh, you either die a hero or pitch long enough to see yourself become the villain. And Matt Harvey has become that. Think about this: in his first three full seasons, um, really realistically, in his two full seasons, 2013, 2015, he was 22 and 13 with an ERA of about 2.5, right around there. 
190 strikeouts, 34, 35 walks. Um, since then, 4 and 10, 5 and 7, 0 and 2 this year. Um, 9 and 19, if you include this year's last two plus seasons. 9 and 19 with the New York Mets in ERA north of 6. And it all culminated earlier this week being traded to the Reds for Devin Maserocco. And Cash. That's it. Devin Maserocco and Cash. And Matt Harvey, this year, they tried so many things. It's a brand new staff, brand new training staff, which is what a lot of people had issues with with the Mets and all their injuries. And, and I was right there with them. I think that was the biggest issue. But Matt Harvey had an opportunity to go to the bullpen to potentially figure things out in uh, in the minor leagues and decided against it, said no, said he didn't want to do that. You know who Matt Harvey is the exact opposite of? Wade Davis. That's right, yeah. Matt Harvey needs to look at Wade Davis because here's my problem with Matt Harvey. He's a mental midget, number one. Uh, I firmly believe this. He doesn't know. He's too egotistical. It's all about him. And he doesn't understand that when things aren't going your way, figure out a different way. Don't try to barrel through and keep doing the same thing. What you're doing isn't working. Find something else. Wade Davis, in his career, uh, when he first came up with the Tampa Bay Rays in 2009, his first three seasons, he was a starter. Uh, 2009, he pitched six games, uh, went two and two. 2010, 29 starts, 12 and 10. 2011, 29 starts, 11 and 10. 2012, went into the bullpen, pitched 70 innings out of the bullpen in 54 games with a 2.43 ERA. Dropped his ERA in 2012 uh, from by. Two point two full runs. He was a 4.45 ERA as a starter in 2011, a 2.43 pitcher in 2012. Ends up moving on after the 2012 season. After the 2012 season, he makes his way over to the Kansas City Royals. Uh, he it was traded for James Shields. Um, and yeah, traded for James Shields, and then 2013. With the Royals, in his first season there, pitches 135 innings as a starter again. 31 31 games, 24 starts. uh, Was not great. 8-11 with a 5.32 ERA. 2014, they put him in the bullpen. He goes 9-2 in 71 starts. Has a 1.00 ERA, including three saves. 2015... A 69 games out of the bullpen, 17 saves, a .94 ERA, 8-1 and one out of the bullpen, was an all-star, finished sixth, two spots, behind, uh, finished sixth in the Cy Young Award, and oh, by the way, won a World Series against the New York Mets. 2016, 187 ERA, 27 saves in 45 appearances, and a 2-1 and one record, another all-star. 2017 with the Chicago Cubs, 59 starts, 32 saves, and a 2.30 ERA, four and two. This year, this year with the Colorado Rockies, <laughs> this is insane. 16 games, 14 saves, 2.35 ERA. Wade Davis couldn't figure it out as a starter, so Tampa Bay put him in the bullpen for one year. He goes over to Kansas City in a trade. They try him out as a starter for one year, send him back to the bullpen. He's a three-time All-Star and a World Series champion. Matt Harvey needs to earn to do what Wade Davis did. John Smoltz is a Hall of Famer because he was able to do both things. He had the mental capacity to sit there and say, you know what? Him and Wade Davis both. They don't need me as a starter. They need me to figure it out in the bullpen. Matt Harvey couldn't do it. He doesn't have that mental capacity. And now he's gone to the Reds, a team that fired their manager two weeks into the season. Two weeks into the season. 
Who knows if he's going to actually start, if anything happens for him. I would love to see Matt Harvey get back and become a better pitcher again. But he's been embarrassing this year, and it's because he doesn't have the mental capacity to understand that just because he's not able to do it how he wants, there's no other way. It's his way or the highway, and those type of players never succeed. You need to learn how to play with how to have your role be the best role for the team. This isn't golf, where you alone control the fate. As a pitcher, yes, you want you feel like you're in complete control. Because if you don't execute your pitch, guy hits it out. But if you don't listen to your catcher, if you don't trust your defense, if you don't trust your offense to be able to get you run support, it doesn't work that way. And Matt Harvey cannot fathom the idea that his role to serve the team is better elsewhere. And now he's going to the Reds, and he's going to have a terrible year. And I'll be 100% honest, I don't think Matt Harvey pitches again after this season. I don't. Because I think what you saw when he refused to go to the minor leagues, when he refused to go to AAA and figure it out, that showed that he thinks he's bigger than the organization. And that's not how things get done anymore. It's not. Ask the Astros. Ask the Cubs. Those teams that have won championships, they got players who sacrifice for the team and who find ways to contribute without performing at their best. Matt Harvey doesn't have the mental ability to do that. We'll switch over and talk NBA, NHL playoffs coming up in just a little bit. Tom Westerholm a few moments away. Celtics beat writer for MassLive.com. What's been the biggest key behind Boston's success this season despite having, in my opinion, two of the top five players in the East out with injury? It's all coming up. You're on Press Row on the Public House Media Network. I'm the Greg. And I am Dave Show. We host the Greg and Dave Show on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out our show, The Greg and Dave Show, where we talk about strange, bizarre, and sometimes just downright quirky news stories that you may not have heard about. A new show comes out every Wednesday. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes. And hey, thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Listen to every episode and get the latest show sent right to you. Subscribe to Press Row on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher.com. Or visit us online at www.thephmedia.com. This is Press Row with Christian Heimel, a public house media podcast. My left stroke just went viral. Right stroke, put a baby in a spiral. Soprano C, we like to keep it on the high note. It's levels to it, you and I know. Tell Welcome back on Press Row. Chris and I are here with you this Thursday, May 10th, 2018. You got game seven tonight between the Nashville Predators, Winnipeg Jets in the Stanley Cup playoffs. You've also got the Western Conference Finals in the NBA set. Same uh, the Eastern Conference Finals uh, coming up as well in just a little bit, just a couple days away here. Want to talk Western Conference Finals, and Tom Westerholm will join us here in about uh, 10, 12 minutes. Um, Celtics beat writer for MassLive.com, and what's been their greatest tool to success uh, here so far. But it, it's really been interesting the way we kind of, and I've said this a couple different times, the East Coast bias in sports because a lot of media members live on the East Coast, and you can watch more games on the East Coast because you're not having to stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning to watch the, you know, watch Mike Trout finish a game or Clayton Kershaw or the Celt- or the uh, Lakers, excuse me, um, the Warriors and all that stuff. You don't have to stay up that late to watch them all. Um, but we've kind of, uh, again, and I, and I brought this up at the top of the show, what we thought was going to happen is uh, it, it's, it's Rockets Warriors, just like we expected it to be in the Western Conference. Now, maybe we didn't expect the Rockets to finish so far ahead uh, of Golden State and to have home court advantage here in this series. But w- this is more or less what we anticipated come the second week of May uh, all the way back in probably November. That being said, I think it's really interesting how much we've kind of ignored 
from a national media standpoint, just how impressive and exciting this matchup is going to be. When you really break it down and you think about it, the Rockets were specific. This Rockets team was specifically built to beat the Warriors from the top down. And I don't mean the addition of, of Chris Paul. I don't mean the improvement of Clint Capella, who, by the way, might be outside LeBron James if he decides to become a free agent, might be one of the more coveted free agents this summer. He's going to get paid this summer. But even Mike D'Antoni as head coach was thought of strictly to beat the Golden State Warriors. D'Antoni, the, 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 the way that the Rockets play is the same way the way the Warriors play. And the Warriors play the same way that Mike D'Antoni's sons played. When, who was the general manager? Steve Kerr, Golden State's head coach. This team was built specifically for this. And I understand that the Warriors and the Hamptons Five um, have been an incredibly impressive group over their four years now. Um, But Chris Paul and James Harden have found a great way to work together. Harden is maybe one of the most unstoppable players in the game right now. He's up there with Anthony Davis, LeBron James, um, and when Steph Curry decides to turn it on, Steph Curry. Uh, but Clint Capella, there I don't think Houston has an answer for him. I, I, I get it. Draymond Green, he, he plays these mind games. He, he's incredibly physical. He's a very talented, versatile player. I understand that. Andre Guadalla is very impressive as well. But Clint Capella has been so damn impressive this year that I don't know if Golden State has a match for them. Now, the Rockets won two out of three games in the regular season. I know the regular season doesn't really mean anything, but when you've got to win at least, you know, four games, when you've got to win four games out of seven, at least two of those need to come at home, and having the Rockets have home court advantage is huge in this series to be able to do that. Um, I really look at guys like uh, Trevor Ariza to lock down defensively. Uh, P.J. Tucker is another one. The guy who I think is the biggest, biggest um, X factor is Eric Bledsoe. Because Eric Bledsoe is probably going to be sixth man of the year. Um, or defensive player of the year. I mean, one of the two. I mean, he's he's been so good. Um. Eric Gordon has just been phenomenal. Uh, Meanwhile, it's going to be, you know, interesting to see how much Steph Curry plays, how much um, Clint Capella is able to handle Draymond Green. Because the other big thing is, I mean, Kevin Durant, nobody knows how to guard him. When he decides to play defense, he's incredibly talented um, and just that much scarier. But I think Eric Gordon's going to be huge on Steph Curry. Same with Trevor Ariza. Um, hitting a couple of big threes. Clint Capella is going to have to find a way to maybe step outside and defend Kevin Durant if he can do that on his own. I don't know. That's going to be the biggest issue is where's Kevin Durant. But then again, you know, he can't stop. Everybody says Kevin Durant can't guard anybody. Well, who's guarding Kevin Durant? You know, that's the biggest thing. I, I don't know exactly where this is going to be made and, and who's going to come away with this series. But I do know that every single piece of this organization, of this Rockets team, was built specifically for this moment to beat the Golden State Warriors. And I think they have the ability to do that. I really do. I'm pretty confident in Houston's ability to beat Golden State. And I think this is a series that goes the distance. I think it goes seven. And with that seventh game being in Houston, the Rockets have the upper hand in my opinion. I know it's hard going against history. Just look at Toronto. (laughs) I I know you're the number one seed, but it's LeBron James and you guys, you know, your your backside gets tighter, uh, you know, than, than a fresh rubber band every time LeBron shows up. So I don't, I know it's hard to go against history. But this Rockets team was built with one mission, and one mission only, to beat this Warrior squad, and they've proven they can do that. And they have the ability to do it. More importantly, 
the Rockets are playing great defense. Phenomenal defense. Forcing 21 turnovers um, per 100 possessions for you super analytical people. They've done a phenomenal job. It, it, it's been amazing. And Andre Iguodala and Draymond Green are, are, are similar in that aspect. The way these two teams play is so similar for multiple reasons. Because of how they're built. They're built with that three-point shooting specialist. They're built with a very talented big man who can step outside. And their coaches think very similarly. Again, Steve Kerr was the GM when Mike D'Antoni was the head coach of the Phoenix Suns. The style that these two teams play was built with Mike D'Antoni, with Steve Nash, and with um, Amari Stoudemire. It was built that way. So don't be surprised at all to see this go full seven games. And I really do think that Houston has the edge. And I don't care what Draymond Green... like. <sighs> Draymond Green is... is when he says certain things, I wonder how much he's actually listening to himself. Like when he says it doesn't matter to us who we play. I, I tell you what, it should matter. Because you got a little bit of trouble with the Pelicans. Not much. But you're going to have a lot of trouble here with this Houston team. You're not the 74-8 and eight team anymore. That loss, by the way, in the championship. I know you've won two out of three titles. But it's it should matter to you. I I know that they've that the Rockets have said they want to beat you, and I know you want to be able to say you know it, it's it's time to stop talking, time to play. Guess what? They're the number one seed. They've got home court advantage, and you guys care about the playoffs. And if you cared that much, you would have gotten the number one seed. So that's that's just my thought there. Just my thought. So. Tom Westerholm going to join us here in a little bit to talk Celtics. Uh, Cavaliers advancing, uh, of course, again. I mean, LeBron James has a chance to go to, I think, what's it, what would this be? Like his ninth, eighth straight NBA Finals. And th- this is the insane part to me. Because uh, we're going to talk with Tom about the Celtics' success. So I want to touch on the Cavs here before we go to break in a couple minutes. <laughs> Those of you who are still LeBron haters need to wake up. You need to stop. Because this is a guy who is the best player on the planet the best player of this generation, and quite arguably, and the argument is getting better and better for him every year, I don't care about the rings, might be the best player of all time. And you're going to hate on him just because you grew up watching Michael Jordan. I grew up watching Michael. I love Michael. But you know what? Watching LeBron is a lot of fun. And for those of you who are hating on him just to hate on him, you don't get to enjoy watching LeBron James. He is fun to watch. And he's getting actual contributions from this supporting cast. Kyle Korver is starting to hit timely threes. Kevin Love is actually stepping outside, hitting big shots, playing strong defensively. J.R. Smith locking down defensively. George Hill, Larry Nance. I mean, these are guys that are really starting to come around now. And LeBron is just so talented and so dominant that it's unbelievable how many people are still hating on LeBron James. Imagine, imagine hating on the Beatles when they were at their peak. Just to hate on them. Because you think you're, you think it's cool to hate on someone. Like, that's what I don't get. You're watching probably the greatest to ever play the game. And you don't get a chance to enjoy it? Come on now. What he's doing is unbelievable this year. At his age, in his 15th season, to play as much as he's playing at as high a level as he is playing. What's interesting, though, is is I think this next round is going to be difficult for him just because you, you look at how talented defensively Boston has been, and I know there, there's nobody who can stop LeBron. Nobody who can do it, especially for four games out of seven. But when you can shut down his supporting cast and make it just about him, that's that's when it becomes difficult. I mean, Indiana tried. Indiana did everything they possibly could, and they almost got him. But he's LeBron. He's the best there is. And 
it, we really do need to stop just hating on him just because he's not Michael. You know what? Michael wasn't Larry. Michael wasn't Magic. Michael wasn't Dr. J. He wasn't uh, Isaiah Thomas. He wasn't Bill Russell. He wasn't Jerry West. But we didn't hate on Mike just because of that, did we? Nope. This this postseason is exactly what we expected it to be. Maybe not exact maybe not exactly, but it's the teams we expected it to be. And instead of enjoying it, we're gonna hate on the Warriors just because we're tired of seeing them win. We're gonna hate on LeBron just because we don't want him to be as good as Michael in our own minds. Stop it. Just enjoy. Like I told you guys last week, if you really hated it, you wouldn't be watching. But you know what? You're still watching, aren't you? You're still flicking on the TV and checking to see who's going to win. And that's on you, that you're not going to get to actually enjoy how talented this guy actually is. It'll be a lot of fun to watch. Tom Westerholm, MassLive.com Celtics beat writer, is going to join us here in just a couple of moments. Talking about the Celtics' success this postseason, who's more, who deserves more credit, GM Danny Ainge? Head coach Brad Stevens, Marcus Smart, Terry Rozier, Al Horford maybe? And do they have a chance against the Cavs? Do they have a chance against the Houston Rockets or the Warriors? Can they even make it that far? And how much should Boston just be excited with whatever they're getting right now? Because next year and the next couple of years is going to be a lot of fun if you're a fan of the Celtics. I'm Christian Heimel. Don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter at Chris Heimel, C-H-R-I-S-H-E-I-M-A-L-L. Subscribe, rate, review, shares with your friends and family, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com. Head over to thephmedia.com and get yourself some awesome press row gear. Help support the show. Continue to make us one of the fastest growing podcasts in the country. We certainly appreciate your guys' support. Uh, we'll also have your listener questions coming up in just a few moments as well. Don't forget to Find us on Facebook, Press Row by Public House Media, Twitter and Instagram at Press Row PHM, or email the show Press Row PHM at gmail.com. Tom Westerholm, MassLive.com. On the other side of the break, this is Press Row. This is Ryan Pierce, host of Completely Serious here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Completely Serious, where we talk about sports and have fun with great guests. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you'll never miss an episode of Completely Serious. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Listen to every episode and get the latest shows sent right to you. Subscribe to Press Row on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher.com. Or visit us online at www.thephmedia.com. This is Press Row with Christian Heimel, a public house media podcast. Back on Press Row here on this Thursday, May 10th, 2018. Christian Eimler here with you. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spreaker.com, iHeartRadio as well. Thank you so much for joining us wherever, however you may be. NBA playoffs uh, approaching the conference finals here in just a few days. Maybe a bigger surprise uh, this season so far, at least the postseason, has been the play of the Boston Celtics without Kyrie Irving, of course, who knew Gordon Hayward was going to be out six minutes in. Tom Westerholm, MassLive.com, covers the Celtics. And, Tom, how much of a surprise has this been in the Celtics locker room, their success? Well, I mean, it depends what you mean by the Celtics locker room. If you're talking to the players, it's not a surprise at all. They expected to be this good. They knew they were this good. I think a lot of them, you know, you talk to somebody like Terry Rozier, and he, he knew that he could do this. Um, and, you know, maybe the rest of us are surprised, but I don't think he is at all. If you talk to any of the media, any of them, I think, you know, maybe some of, some of the people around the team, um, then you might, you know, there might, then you, the surprise level might go up a little bit. But I think the players expected to be here. I think they expected to be, you know, maybe not up, you know, like big in a series, but I think that they definitely thought that they were good enough, you know, to be at this point. 
for them to go through what they did in the in the first round, was it more of a shock to for, to see them up 3-0 over Philadelphia or, or just to be up in the series in general against what many people thought, and Vegas including, uh, a, a better team in the 76ers? Yeah, I think the first round kind of threw everybody for a little bit of a loop because the Bucks are a little bit better than everybody thought. You know, they've got, especially defensively, they've got, you know, long athletic guys who can defend a bunch of different positions and who are really, you know, can switch everything. And, you know, the Sixers don't really have that. They've got a bunch of guys who, you know, can maybe be exploited in mismatches, you know, defensively when you start looking at, um, you know, to Marco Bellinelli, you start looking at, you know, Ersan Eliasova. You know, those guys have really just kind of gotten abused by, you know, faster players. Um, so I think that the first round series, just in terms of in terms of matchups, maybe kind of threw off the expectations a little bit, just because I think the Bucks are a better matchup in a lot of ways than the Sixers are for the Celtics. So what is it about this team that, that has been so dominant or was so talented against the Sixers? I mean, it wasn't as if they were blowing them out every single game, but to be able to come back like they did in game <laughs> two from 22 points down, I mean, what about this team has maybe switched gears without – arguably two of the maybe 10 best players, five best players potentially in the Eastern Conference in Gordon Hayward and Kyrie Irving? It's a great question. I mean, it's, and it, you know, it's something they've been doing all year. Um, and it, it, it's funny because it doesn't really matter who is in the lineup. You know, they've been coming back from big deficits when Kyrie was playing. You know, they've been coming back from big deficits now without him. They just, they don't quit. I mean, I think some of that is the coaching. Um, obviously, Brad Stevens does a phenomenal job. Um, but if you ask Brad Stevens, it's, you know, on the players that Danny Ainge has brought in, kind of the, the attitude that Danny Ainge goes out, you know, looking to fill, like the, the type of guy that he really wants to put in that locker room. And I think that makes a big difference. You know, if you, again, bringing up Terry Rozier, I mean, that, that, that's a very competitive guy who wants to win um, and who just, you know, he's not going to give up. The same for Marcus Smart. You know, Jason Tatum is quiet, but he's, you know, he's a, he's a very competitive guy who's, you know, going to talk some trash, and he, he believes in himself. And Jalen Brown's the same way. So I think a lot of these guys, they have the right mentality to rally. They have the right mentality to pull out wins. It doesn't matter that they're young. You know, they're just they're just going to kind of go out and do it because they, they know how to play basketball. Speaking with Tom Westerholm, Celtics beat writer for MassLive.com, you brought up Terry Rozier and Marcus Smart. I mean, when Smart came back in that first round, it seemed as though the defensive intensity kind of went up a little bit. How much has him has his return to the lineup helped this team? He's huge. And, you know, it's, it, he's one of those players that's going to score nine points and have a completely outsized impact, um, you know, well beyond those nine points. Um defensively he just gives them so many different looks because he's so versatile you know he can guard guards obviously he can do that really well but then you know he can also switch on to ben simmons and ben simmons really wants no parts of him um when you know when he's matched up with him one-on-one smart's just a bully and he's, he's so strong and he uses his he's more athletic this year he's definitely in better shape and that has made a big difference i think um so I mean, for this team, you know, that that really relies on defense, I think he's probably, if he's not their best defender, he's, you know, number two or three. Um, you know, some order between him, Jalen Brown when he's healthy, and Al Horford, those, those are kind of the three guys. But he's, he's, he's been phenomenal. He, he's, they're going to have to take a really hard look at how much money they want to pay him this summer, but they're not going to be willing to give him up easily. How much has it helped this team that six minutes into the season they had to learn how to play without Gordon Hayward, and then with a month prior to the playoffs they had to learn how to play without Kyrie Irving? How much has that time without those two players helped? You know, I think they're going to really reap the benefits next year. Um, I think that when, you know, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, they get these reps, they get these opportunities to become, you know, potential future stars, to, to really flex their muscles and really kind of learn how to, you know, how to do this at the highest level, especially Tatum. Um, you've really seen the Celtics just go to him over and over and over, and he just keeps delivering. Um, as far as this season, you know, obviously, you know, every rep is valuable, especially for a young team. And I think that, you know, that, that that's going to make a big difference, especially, you know, as the Celtics continue. But um, I think next year is really where you're going to start to see everything come together. Obviously, Hayward and Kyrie are expected to be back. And, you know, I don't know how anybody's going to stop those lineups when uh, when they start to put, you know, when they start to put everything together. I know it's impressive to talk about right now, and a lot of those guys who were on last year's team, uh, part of that trade for Kyrie Irving, but I think a lot of people forget that the Celtics were in the Eastern Conference Finals a year ago, and guys like Jalen Brown and Marcus Spart had those reps a year ago. Does that kind of factor into how they're playing right now? I think it does to an extent. Um, I think, you know, especially 
you know, somebody like Smart, especially, obviously, Al Horford's been there before. Um, but, you know, I, with Jalen, it's a little tough to tell because he didn't necessarily get as many minutes. He wasn't as big a factor on last year's team as, you know, for example, Jason Tatum is on this year's team. So um, I, I think that it makes a difference. Um, I, I think it honestly just comes down more to the mentality. I, I don't know that it's necessarily the reps. I think that it's just kind of this idea that, you know, they don't, they're not intimidated. And whether that's because they're young and they don't know any better or they're just like they've got that kind of, you know, attitude, that kind of swagger to them, I think either way, you know, it works out really well for them. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's probably something to do with the reps. Um, but I think, you know, as, as much as anything, it's just the attitude. MassLive.com's beat writer, Celtics beat writer Tom Westerholm joining us here on Press Row. This is going to sound a little weird to ask because of how little he, or I should say how young his NBA career still is, but – Whose Hall of Fame uh, ballot does this help more, Danny Ainge or Brad Stevens? <laughs> um, you know, I think if you asked around the league at this point, people would feel pretty good about both of those guys at this point. Um, I, I, it's it's really tough to differentiate because, look, I mean, Danny just keeps giving Brad the best tools for his toolbox, and Brad just keeps using them over and over and over again. So, you know, I think – you know, you can look around the roster and kind of split it up maybe. Um, you know, I think that Rozier is a huge win for Danny Ainge. He, you know, saw him at, like, number 16, and everybody thought that was a huge reach. And instead, you know, he's a starting point guard on a team that, you know, is in a great position going forward. And, you know, the same with Jason Tatum. Everybody thought that Markel Fultz was a no-questions-asked guy, and Danny Ainge went out and got Jason Tatum. But, you know, you look at other guys. I mean, Jalen Brown has developed really well under Brad Stevens. He's, I mean, you could say the same thing about Rozier. He's developed really well as well, and it's and it's not just player development, it's also winning games. You know, there's some coaches that are player development coaches, some that win games, and Brad Stevens has been doing both. So, you know, I think um, at this point, you know, you could definitely make the case that both of them are very much on track to, to, to be at that point at some point here. It's so strange, though, to watch Stevens, and, and we saw it more so with the out-of-bounds plays off of timeouts. And uh, for a guy like myself <laughs> who's covered college basketball for, for more than a decade, this is the stuff you see in college basketball. And a bunch of, of Stevens' old players at Butler say, yeah, we've been running that for eight years. Yeah, and I mean, you know, Stevens will tell you a hundred times that at Butler he was doing it with, uh, you know, future dentists. So I think it's a little nicer for him now <laughs> to be doing it with the likes of Al Horford and, uh, you know, I mean, now he's got a team full of lottery picks that he's doing it with. So, oh, yeah. you know, that's a, that, that's a big difference. There was a, there was a clip that was floating around the internet of a play at Butler that was the, it was the same set that he ran to win them the game in game three, um, just by all of Butler's old players. And I mean, they kind of flubbed it and it didn't look that good, but you could tell that the action was really good. And then, you know, when he's got a, you know, an NBA player in Marcus Morris inbounding to an NBA all-star in Al Horford. Yeah, it, it looks a little better. So, uh, you can uh, kind of see where, you know, maybe where the genius started in his Butler days. And, and then in the same token, I mean, Danny Ainge with that trade for, for Tatum, uh, eventually the pick that became Tatum, might even get him a top five draft pick this summer, depending on how the lottery ball bounces. So um, one thing, all this stuff is we talked with you back in the summer when the trade for Kyrie went down. Uh, all of this leads to what does this mean for the Celtics in terms of making the NBA Finals and potentially winning an NBA championship? Considering how LeBron has been playing in this postseason and considering the Rockets and the Warriors, does any of what's happening right now give the Celtics and their fan base enough confidence to make an NBA Finals or maybe even bring home a championship this year? This year, I, I, it, it's very hard to see. Um, I mean, you know, like, like you said, LeBron looms on the horizon. I mean, if, you know, facing him, the Celtics are going to have – a very different type of matchup issue than they have against the Sixers. Obviously, LeBron, you know, they, they don't have any answers for him, whereas Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, they've had answers in Al Horford and, uh, and Aaron Baines. So, you know, that that's completely different. Um, you know, th their defense is great, but LeBron is probably greater. Um, and then if they do manage to topple the Cavaliers, yeah, I mean, like you said, the Rockets, the Warriors, like those guys are uh, – those are some really good teams. But I think when you start looking down the line, I think as soon as next year you can start talking about the Celtics as a real contender, I think, you know, two or three years, four years from now, that's when you start talking about them as a, like a potential juggernaut. Like this team is on the rise. They're going to be really good for a long time. You know, however the rest of this season shakes out, I think that that much is pretty clear at this point. Tom Westerholm, Celtics beat writer for MassLive.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Tom underscore NBA. Tom, we appreciate it. Enjoy the ride the rest of this postseason. All right, man. Thanks a lot. All right, Tom Westerholm there of MassLive.com. Again, the Twitter handle at Tom underscore NBA. And uh, look, I mean, this is the insane part. No matter what the Celtics do this year, 
they're going to be the favorite in the East next year, unless LeBron leaves for Philadelphia. That's the only thing, because, or depending who goes to Cleveland to join LeBron, who knows. But when you look at this Celtics roster, they're without Gordon Hayward, they're without Kyrie Irving, who, in my opinion, two of the top five players in the East. It's LeBron James, Kyrie Irving, uh, John Wall, Ben Simmons, and then probably Gordon Hayward is in there in the top five. Uh, and the Celtics right now, because of that trade, this is the interesting thing that you have to remember. With that trade that Danny Ainge made with the, the Sixers, the Lakers pick is a uh, that the Sixers then flipped. There's a protected pick in there. If the Lakers, where they are right now, if the Lakers end up with the number one pick in the lottery or picks six through ten, that falls to the Sixers. However... If that lottery pick is 2, 3, 4, or 5, it's the Celtics pick. It's very confusing. It's really annoying. We'll break it down more and try to get a, a true full answer as we get closer once the NBA lottery actually happens and we get closer to the draft. But you heard Westerholm say it. This is, a, this is a team that is set up to become a juggernaut in the Eastern Conference. Not just a, a contender, a juggernaut in the Eastern Conference. Same with the 76ers. And listen, this whole series with the Celtics and with the Sixers, Brad Stevens outcoached Brett Brown has outcoached him completely. Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, by all accounts, are better than the tandem of Al Horford and Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Mark, whoever you want to put in there right now. By all accounts, the Sixers are on paper a better team, but Brad Stevens has outcoached Brett Brown, and there was no more evident than in Game 2. In Game 2, the Sixers are up 22 points, and in that 8, 9, or 6-minute stretch, whatever it was that the Celtics cut that lead from 22 to 5, Brett Brown didn't call a single timeout, didn't do anything to break up that rhythm. And Brad Stevens, meanwhile, has drawn up plays consistently, and this isn't anything new. This has been his entire career. It's just more amplified now because there isn't Kyrie Irving and there isn't Jason Tatum, or excuse me, there isn't uh, Gordon Hayward. But Brad Stevens has outcoached Brett Brown simply and purely this entire postseason. And whether or not he can outcoach LeBron James in the next round or outcoach Steve Kerr or Mike D'Antoni in the finals if they make it there, it, who knows? But this has been really impressive to watch the Celtics here this postseason without, in my opinion, two of the top five players in the Eastern Conference. Whether it means they can actually get to the NBA Finals, potentially win the NBA Finals, who knows? But uh, the future is bright in Boston, and all of this, you're playing with house money. You really are. Because it doesn't matter what happens this year. Next year, this team is going to be so talented, so scary good. It's unbelievable to think about what this team can potentially do next year. And a lot of it will ride it. I mean, we kind of touched on a little bit, but on what Marcus Smart does in the offseason and if he goes anywhere. But when we return, your listener questions, and we'll wrap up shop here. It's Press Row on the Public House Media Network. This is Sam Kirby, host of Cinema Stories here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Cinema Stories, where we hang out and just talk movie and TV news and reviews, and it's awesome. A new show comes out every single Tuesday. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Cinema Stories. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Want to be part of the show? Go to Facebook and search Press Row Podcast dash Public House Media. Or find us on Twitter and Instagram at Press Row PHM. You can also email the program Press Row PHM at gmail.com. This is Press Row with Christian Heimel, a Public House Media podcast. I feel so close to you right now. It's a force field. I wear my heart up on my sleeve like a big deal. Your love bars down on me. Final segment here on this Thursday, May 10th, 2018. Christian Hamill here with you on Press Row, broadcasting as part of the Public House Media Network. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, share us with your friends and family. We're on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, of course, ThePHMedia.com, where you can go and get some awesome cheap seat swag as well. Get yourself some gear from uh, the website there. Help support the show and continue to make us one of the fastest-growing sports podcasts in the country. You can also find us on social media, Press Row by Public House Media, 
You can check us out on Twitter and Instagram at PressRowPHM or email the show, PressRowPHM at gmail.com. Find me on Twitter at Chris Heimel, C-H-R-I-S-H-E-I-M-A-L-L. Get to your listener questions, as always, submitted via social media. We appreciate it so much. Uh, Matt in Texas, Jerry Jones says the Cowboys should expect a different Ezekiel Elliott. What do you expect from the Cowboys running back here this season? Um, I, I don't know, to be 100% honest, because he, here's the biggest issue that I have with this Cowboys offense. Um, you know, their left their offensive line was hurt last year, which didn't help at all. No Des Bryant, no Jason Witten. Um, Alan Hearns is a great addition from that standpoint. And I know Zeke's going to get to play a full season, so I expect a better year, obviously. Um, 983 yards, seven touchdowns, and 242 carries in 10 games last year. You know he's going to have better numbers than that because he's actually going to play all 16 games. However, what I don't understand uh, and what I'm not sure of with regards to this team is how they're going to utilize Alan Hearns, what they're going to do to replace Jason Witten, um, if that offensive line can stay healthy. And then the biggest, the biggest problem... This is the biggest problem with the Dallas Cowboys. It's Jason Garrett as the head coach because this is a guy who behind the best offensive line in football with arguably the best running back in the game still had Dak Prescott throwing the ball 40, 45 times a game uh, two years ago. So as much as I would expect to see a different Ezekiel Elliott, I don't know if you're going to see a you know 2,000-yard rusher. I don't know if you're going to see a 1,400-yard rusher because... I don't know if Jason Garrett's going to rely that heavily on him like he should. Um, Alan Hearns, I think, is a great pickup, but you don't have a tight end anymore to really take uh, anything off of of Prescott. All Prescott has now is Hearns and an aging Cole Beasley um, and and an offensive line that wasn't 100% last year. So uh, I do expect a better Zeke Elliott. I don't know if I would expect the same Zeke Elliott we saw two years ago. I, I, I wouldn't expect that at all. Um, but, you know, should be fun to see. should be interesting to watch and see what happens there uh, with the Cowboys, especially in a division that has, you know, the defending Super Bowl champions. The Giants, by all accounts, are going all in on winning not just the division but the Super Bowl this year. Um, and the Washington Redskins added Alex Smith, who I think is an upgrade at quarterback over Kirk Cousins as much as I love Kirk Cousins. So the Cowboys have a lot to work on here uh, because they could easily be the third best team in this division if they don't play their cards right. Uh, But who knows? So hopefully Zeke is at least better than last year. And if everybody stays healthy, he will be. So that's kind of the biggest issue. Um, Jason in New Orleans, uh, should the Saints add another running back during Mark Ingram's suspension? Uh, No, and they said they're not going to. So I wouldn't um, expect New Orleans to add anybody. Uh, I know DeMarco Murray's out there, Adrian Peterson potentially again, but You've got Alvin Kamara, who was tremendous, the Rookie of the Year last year, um, and it's four games, and it's the first four games of the year. Now, when you look at the Saints' schedule for the first four games, that's where it gets a little bit interesting here. Um, Their first two games, Tampa Bay and Cleveland, those should be easy wins at home for New Orleans this coming season, Uh, especially with Alvin Kamara and with Drew Brees, who, you know, the Angels wonder in the future Hall of Famer. Where it gets interesting is when you go on the road to Atlanta and then the Giants in back-to-back weeks. Those are going to be interesting. If you can just stay 2-2, two and two, though, that's that's all that really matters before you get Mark Ingram back to play at home against Washington and then the bye week. So you don't really need to sign anybody. If you want to, you know, you look at the depth chart there for them, and they may end up giving more opportunities to Trey Edmonds, um, which I wouldn't be surprised at all about. So who knows? And then you could run a little bit of Wildcat, have some more options for guys like Ted Ginn Jr., um, you know, Michael Thomas, Willie Sneed, uh, or excuse me, uh, Sneed's no longer there, but uh, you look at Colby Fleener even. So I wouldn't be surprised at all, you know. There's no need to sign another quarterback, or another running back, excuse me, for the Saints. uh, As long as they can get through their first couple games. That's all that really matters. I mean, remember when Tom Brady was injured? A couple of years ago, he was going to miss the first four, or his, no, the suspension, excuse me, from Deflategate. The first four uh, games he was going to miss because of suspension. And everyone's like, all the Patriots have to do is get through it two and two. And they did, and they won the Super Bowl. You know, Jacoby Brissett figured it out. Jimmy Garoppolo figured it out for them for those four games. So 
it, it's not as imperative a position like quarterback where you want to go and try to figure it out. Alvin Kamara is going to be great for those four games. Your first two are not tremendous opponents. Your second two are what's a little bit concerning, but I wouldn't be worried at all if I'm the uh, if, if I'm the New Orleans Saints for those first four games. So no worries there. Um, Mark Ingram not being there will be just fine, and uh, the Saints should be at least two and two, maybe three and one. Um, who, who knows? Uh, maybe even four and zero heading into to getting Mark uh, Ingram back when he faces off with the Redskins in Week Five. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Brandon in Baltimore, you excited to see Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson group together at the players this weekend? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pumped to see it. I mean, it, it's great to, today starting the players championship, which is a very fun golf course. A lot you know, it's, it's great to watch the players championship is one of those ones. It's considered the fifth major, uh, a lot of times because of how challenging the course is and how many great players are there. When you look at it, uh, at who's going to be there, Phil Mickelson and Tiger Woods and Ricky Fowler are all in the same pairing today uh, on this Tuesday or on this Thursday, excuse me. Uh, and TPC Sawgrass, with the course of the 17th hole, is phenomenal. It's so great. And, and, but you look at the field and some of these pairings with some of these guys, it's going to be great. I mean, Ian Poulter, Justin Rose are paired together. That'll be fun to watch. Dustin Johnson, Bubba Watson paired together with Brooks Kepka. Uh, and Stuart Sink, that'll be fun. Um, Adam Scott and Danny Willett, an up-and-coming golfer, will be fun. Um, Jordan Spieth and Justin Thompson. The, the pairings here are great for this weekend, at least for for this Thursday. And then, of course, you know it's always fun when you've got two legends of the game, legends of the sport, in Mickelson and Woods playing together. You know, so to see Tiger and Phil and Ricky Fowler all play together. Um, Jason Duffner and Steve Stricker are going to be there um, in a different group as well. It's it's just really great to see this because it draws people in on Thursday when most golf tournaments, even the Masters and, and the you know the British Open and the majors, you don't really pay attention until the weekend. You kind of check in every now and again. Oh, all right, fine. You'll watch the highlights at night, but nobody really pays much attention during the week because of the players, because of this tournament what it means to these guys and how exciting the course is to watch. That's what makes this so much fun. Um, the 17th hole, you know, it, TPC Sawgrass is probably one of the top five golf courses that I would love to play if I given that opportunity with, you know, Pinehurst, Augusta, St. Andrews, Pebble Beach. Uh, I mean, it's, it's right up there. So it's... it's just a lot of fun to watch. And so I'll be watching today. I hope you guys will be too, just because... This doesn't happen very often. They've been playing together for 20 years. They've been playing golf against each other for 20 years, and it's rare that they actually get paired together. This is the first time at this tournament in 17 years. First time since 2001 um, you know that they did it. Uh, Tiger's excited about it. Um, Phil's excited about it. Last time they actually played together uh, in a tournament was the PGA Championship. In 2014, they played the first two rounds together. Tiger missed the cut, and Mickelson went on to finish second. So uh, you got two guys who have combined to win 19 majors, 122 titles. Um, yeah, so it's it's impressive. This will be a lot of fun to watch. I'm excited to see it. I hope you guys are too. So uh, And then adding Ricky Fowler certainly helps. So that, that'll definitely make things a little bit more interesting. Uh, final question, Lindsay in Tennessee, who you got tonight, Game 7, Nashville Predators or Winnipeg Jets? Um, I'm going to pick from the heart here. I'm going Nashville. I, I love the Predators being uh, from that area and watching this team and this city grow to love one another and become such an integral bond between one another, uh, a great relationship between the team and the city. Uh, I think the way that the Predators played in Game 6, that in- impressive defense was uh, is going to be huge for them. Having home ice, obviously, is a big help. Roman Yossi is tremendous. Uh, Colton Sissons is great. Philip Forsberg has made some insane goals uh, this postseason, especially this series. And then, of course, whenever you have um, a guy like Pecorine between the pipes, uh, it's it's going to help you in that case. That being said, Winnipeg has been absolutely tremendous. I, I love this Winnipeg team. It's a lot of fun to watch them. Hockey is just, it's so much fun to watch because you get so many of these young players that just start stepping up. 
um, in different ways. And it's it's a lot of fun to see it happen. Um, you know, Mark uh, Schiaffelli, I can't pronounce that name, no matter how many Scheifold, no matter how many times I get the opportunity to, to watch him play is a lot of fun. Um, you know, guys like Connor McDavid, of course, with Edmonton, uh, you hope to see them get back in, in it every now and again. Uh, but, I mean, Colton McKinnon for uh, the Avalanche. It, it's great to see these young players and to see these these media markets that, you know, Winnipeg used to be a great hockey ma- market. It is, again, Nashville never was. Vegas this year, you know, first time ever. Still the best story in sports, in my opinion. Um, so it's great to see both of these teams and all of these markets get together and really – start having success. So really pumped, uh, excited for the Capitals again uh, to make the Eastern Conference Finals first time in 20 years to face Tampa Bay, a team that has, in Florida, you don't think of it as a hockey market, but they've become that, and it's great to see. Uh, And then, of course, you know, Nashville back-to-back, potentially back-to-back trips to the Stanley Cup if they can get to the Western Conference Finals here tonight. So I'm going to go with my Predators tonight uh, and hope that they can get past this very, very talented uh, upstart Winnipeg team, but should be a lot of fun either way. Really hope uh, you guys enjoy it, tune into it as well, because uh, there's nothing like a Game 7, uh, especially in the Stanley Cup playoffs. It's one of the more exciting things that can happen in the world of sports. Big thank you to everybody who's been a part of the show. We appreciate you guys sending us your questions. As always, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at PressRowPHM. Find us on Facebook, Press Row Podcast by Public House Media. Email the show, PressRowPHM at gmail.com. If you want to find me, I'm on Twitter at Chris Heimel, C-H-R-I-S-H-E-I-M-A-L-L. Big thanks to Tom Westerholm, Celtics beat writer, MassLive.com, breaking down the Celtics postseason success here. Subscribe, rate, review, share us with your friends, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, and of course, the phmedia.com. Get yourself some awesome press row swag there by heading over to the website. Been a fun show. Happy to have you a part of it. As always, I'm Christian Heimel. I'll see you next week on Press Row.